Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Baumhauer's Victory Grill, another edition of Hey Coach and the Nick Saban Show. Eli Gold with our special media guest tonight, Tom Rinaldi. Always great to have you in town, Tom. Thank you very much. It's a treat. And Coach Saban, I understand you and uh, Tom had a nice day today, sharing stories, telling uh, jokes, and opening up to one another. Well, I tell you what, I really miss this guy. We were saying the same <laughs> I, I thing. I really do. Yeah. You know, when he was at ESPN, we got to see each other a lot more often. And um, he's one of the most professional people and has a unique ability when he's interviewing you to make you feel totally relaxed and yep. at ease and uh, to be yourself and to share information. And I feel some of the best interviews are because of him, at least for me. I'm just um, waiting for the shoe to drop right now, and no, so is Miss Terry, it's who's not, right it's there. Not, it's written all over her face right now. It's not going to. This is because I miss you. I just want to show my appreciation. Yeah. I just want to show my appreciation for your professionalism. So, <laughs> but that you know, it is the truth, Tom, and we we do miss you here, and you have that. Uh, ability to get people to open up to you and not every interviewer can do that well thank you very much i'm blushing right now i'll tell you that well that's quite all right since you're blushing why don't you go ahead and open up with the first question of the evening we had such a good visit today but uh you know time is always limited and you said so many things that i could have followed up on but nick one of the things you said you have been given the success of the program in the the position usually unique, but for you repeatedly, of having to try to back up success with more success. Given the shape of last season, its unique nature and character, this team that returns, wanting that same kind of success, what's different? The goal is the same, what's different in the dynamic of the challenge? Well, I, I think it's uh, the personality that you have on each and every team is a little bit different. And I think that's one of the most challenging things for you as a coach. Like last year's team, we had great leadership. We had a lot of older players that had played a lot. They were very confident guys. They knew how to prepare. They went into the games. They played fast. They had fun. They weren't affected by anything that happened in the game. And when you play with guys that have less experience and have played less and are younger, uh, and, and you can call it competitive maturity. Um, it's a little more challenging to get them to play with consistency, uh, to know how to prepare for the game, to do things right all the time, and how that's going to impact and affect your ability to, you know, sort of be successful. Uh, but also you have to deal with the complacency factor. You know, the, last year's team had a great sense of purpose. You know, people forget the year before. Uh, we got knocked out. We lost at Auburn. Uh, we got knocked out. We didn't go to the SEC championship game. We ended up going to the, the Capital One Bowl or whatever. Um, so the players had something to prove, and they were really sort of with it. And a lot of guys came back because they wanted to prove something. Mm. And they were a lot of good players, and they had a lot of experience and a lot of maturity. You know, we had six guys that were true freshmen. You know, when we won the 2017 National Championship game against Georgia on the field, on offense, when we won the game at the end of the game in overtime. And those guys were, a lot of them on last year's team. That was remarkable because uh, a number of them have a, had a very clear chance to leave, Nick. And this is when you often talk about, I think this is so important, adding value. We're here to help you maximize your value in all phases of your life. And guys came back collectively. And I think all those guys did. You know, Najee Harris would have been a second or third round pick. He got picked in the first round. Smitty was a second round pick. He got picked in the first round. So you're talking about guys making 15, 20 million dollars more, but they had something to, to really prove. And, um, you know, this year's team, I love the players on this year's team. I don't, but it's, it's a different dynamic when you have, you feel like as a coach, you're always trying to help players make good choices and decisions so that they have a chance to be successful personally, academically, and athletically. But it takes a lot of personal discipline on their part. You know, I always talk about feeling versus choice. You know, you're going to do what you feel like doing or you're going to choose to do the things you need to do to be successful. Well, that takes a lot of self-discipline, a lot of mental toughness to force yourself to do things that you don't feel like doing. And then on the other hand, 
you got to make a good choice and decision about knowing things that you're not supposed to do that you want to do. You don't need to do those things either because they can have a detrimental effect on your ability to be successful. So uh, th this is all a part of growing up, and I think you're going to have those kinds of ups and downs as you lose 25% of your team and you replace those guys with younger players on your team. So it just becomes a work in progress to be consistent. Uh, but I do think the one thing that has made this program sort of be able to sustain success is we've always really tried to get the players to make good choices and decisions to do the right things so that they create value for themselves. And the p players that buy into that inevitably do very well. They do very well in school. They do very well in their life, even if they didn't play in the NFL. But they do very well because they created great habits. And, and that's the thing that we're always striving for. And sometimes we feel like we're having a little more success than others, but it's a work in progress. It's like being a parent. You know, I mean, everybody out there that's been a parent, uh, you know that sometimes your children don't do things exactly like you'd like for them to. And um, you get a little frustrated, uh, but you try to figure out a better way. I, and that's what we're always trying to do with, you know, the players on our team. And because all those individual players make the team what it is. Uh, and that's what we're still working to try to find that chemistry and identity on this team where we can play consistently. And we need to do it now. You know, I mean, it's, it's the end of the season. Mm -hmm. It's November. Uh, for all those things that we're talking about, we still create an opportunity for ourselves. If we can finish the right way, uh, we can have a great season. And, of course, the fans who always say, well, what's coming up next week? Uh, you can't look past this week. I mean, this team, no, they're not an SEC team. We're not going to try and sell that to the, to the listening audience. But these kids can play football. Well, everybody can play. You should always respect your opponent. And technically, you should respect what they do. Because if you don't technically respect what they do, you can't ever prepare for the game correctly. So exactly. you're never going to go out there and be able to execute the way you want to. But from our team's perspective, this is about who we are as a team. This is about how we need to play, how we need to improve. I, and go out there and play with consistency and get 11 guys doing what they're supposed to do on the same page all right, so that we can con have more consistency in our execution. Um, you know, the way we played offense last week is certainly not the way we want to play offense. I mean, I think somebody told me this is the first time in 36 games we didn't score over 30 points. No. That's right. Yeah. All right, so, I, I mean, I didn't know that stat. Somebody said that to me. Uh, and so to only score 20 points in a game uh, and really not have a lot of other opportunities, you know, to score either because we didn't consistently move the ball. And uh, I'd say we need to do a lot better job as coaches because there were too many times in the game where our players were put at a disadvantage because they were not prepared for what the other team was doing. And, but there was a significant number of times where we knew exactly what we were doing and we didn't execute it very well. So the combination of those two things is something that, um, you know, we really need to improve on this week. And practice has been good. I think the players uh, have had pretty good attention to detail. But I tell you, I always like to see teams compete the way our team competed in the fourth quarter of the game. Made all the plays in three series, three series where they could have scored, made all the plays we needed to make to stop them uh, to be able to have a chance to win the game. So um, that competitive character is also a plus and a bonus that everybody should acknowledge and appreciate as well. Definitely. On the phone, Coach, is our first caller of the night, Pee Wee, joining us from Grand Bay, Alabama. And, of course, since he was last with us on this radio show, his mom passed away, as, as you and I have both acknowledged on other programs. Pee Wee, it's great to have you with us. And, uh, again, accept uh, all of our condolences uh, for your loss. Uh, thank you all very much. Pee Wee, uh, Coach, our, how you our, doing? our thoughts and prayers are with you. Um, you know, there's never anything that anyone can say that's actually good. Uh, when something like this happens, you lose someone close to, to you, uh, like your mother. Um, but we also have to have gratitude for all the time that we had, uh, the love that we had, and the lessons that we learned. Um, and that's something that we'll always remember, so that will always keep her alive in our heart and mind. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, Coach, for those kind words. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, you touched uh, a little bit on what I was going to ask this evening. You had made mention earlier in the week that 
during uh, the game you needed to do or the coaches needed, needed to do a better job of the in-game adjustments. When you have a team like LSU that played a lot of stuff that you had never seen before and blitz what maybe seemed like 80% of the, the entire night, how tough is it to make those in-game adjustments under those circumstances? Well, I think you have to systematically have ways to um, – that the players have background that you can draw on to be able to say, hey, Florida did this, and this is how we had to adjust. You know, the one thing that we always do on Monday – is anything we had an issue or problem with in a game, we do what we call a corrections period. It has nothing to do with the next team we're playing, all right? But there's so much copycat that goes on in all of football, at all in high school, college, NFL. You see a team that does something or has a blitz that works against you, you're going to see it again. Uh, if, you know, we can't match a pass pattern on defense, we're going to see it again. So... You have to be able to adapt and adjust. So if we make those corrections after every game, all right, we should have given our players some uh, sense of what to do if those situations ever came up again. Uh, and that's a responsibility that we all have. But because they had never done those things, it wasn't fresh in our mind, and we didn't you know, have the tools uh, in some cases that we'd like but we've, we've corrected all those things, and I think that we won't have those issues in the future. And, Tom, you see, that's what I love about – and, Pee Wee, thanks so much for calling in. That's what I love about this show. We get guys like Pee Wee who just call in and start talking about adjustments and in-game changes, this, that. Uh, do you see that at other schools as you travel around? As they, are the fan bases – as in tune to what's going on as they are here? I mean, the Tide fan base is unique. It, 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 you know, I know the, the entire conference lives under the motto, it, it, it just means more. But if there's a capital city of it meaning more, this is obviously it. This and, is it. This is it. At the, at the, and it. And it's a good thing. It sure is. I mean, it, it, it's what makes it special to be the coach when you have so many people that have so much interest and so much passion in what you do. And some people get upset sometimes because... Maybe we get criticized, but sometimes we deserve to get criticized uh, because we didn't do things as well as we should have. But we're our own best critics, I can promise you all that, because we're looking at it every day, and uh, when we're not doing things to the Bama standard, and uh, whether it's coaching or you know, getting the players to do things the way we want, want them to do it, you know, we're working hard to try to fix it every day. What's one piece of criticism at any point in the journey? One piece of criticism that's motivated you? Losing. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, look, I think everybody... What, what, why, every, why is defeat more, a more potent experience than victory for you? Well, it's not just for me. I think it's human nature. I think, I think everybody you, out there... You, you yeah, think but, for most people, they focus more on defeat than victory. No, I don't know if they focus more on defeat, but I think everybody has fear of failure. I mean, anybody that's in this room all right, that ever went and took a test when you were in school and you weren't anxious and nervous and fearful about what the result was going to be, stand up. If you've never experienced that, how many people you see standing up? Zero. 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 Yeah. All right. So now, if you really, really prepared well, I mean, you really prepared well, you knew the information, you were 100% confident in what you were going to do, that anxiety kind of wasn't as great, right? Because you had confidence because you had prepared the right way. So I, I think we all have a little bit of fear of failure. And uh, that's a motivating factor for us. Um, and... Everybody wants to win, and what I've always tried to do, which keeps me away from fear of failure, and it also keeps me away from thinking about winning, is staying focused on not the outcome, but what you have to do to get the outcome. That's always been what I try to do. And if you do that as a player and you do it as a competitor, you don't have the anxiety because you're not, you're not thinking about the outcome. You're thinking about what you have to do to get it all the time, and uh, it makes it a lot more fun to play. Does that's Coach Nick Saban, our special media guest, the great Tom Rinaldi in town joining us. We're coming right back. We've got a lot more from Baumhauer's Victory Grill. The Nick Saban Show is presented by Alpha Insurance. 
here on the Crimson Tide Sports Network from Learfield. Here's the snap, pressure off the edge. Here's the throw, Mechie open. Touchdown, Alabama. He cut away from Dwight McLaughlin coming to the near sideline. And despite the pressure coming in on Bryce Young, he hit the man in a pinpoint fashion. And Bama takes the lead. Part of Alabama's performance against the LSU Tigers a weekend ago. Don't forget this Saturday, bright and early, an 11 o'clock kickoff. We're on the air at 8 o'clock in the morning on Saturday morning from Bryant-Denny Stadium as we welcome you back this segment of the Nick Saban Show presented by Royal Furniture, family-owned and operated for 75 years. Royal Furniture has locations in Tuscaloosa, Birmingham, Memphis, and Jackson, Tennessee for your shopping convenience. Coach, we have a question from the Nick Saban radio show blog. And the first question tonight is from Robbie in Niceville, Florida. Says, hey coach, how do you feel about our team's strength and conditioning heading into this final stretch of the season? Lots of big games ahead, as if we didn't know, but thank you and roll tide. It's a good question from Robbie. Right, well, I think uh, it's really, really good. Uh, we're much more scientific in the way we approach all this stuff now, and you heard me talk about this before, about being able to evaluate every guy's explosiveness, every guy's um, speed, you know, in each and every practice, uh, how they do in the weight room in terms of what their explosiveness is, what their power is, uh, when they lift weights on Monday and Thursday. So uh, we have a much better way to monitor this than in the old days when you just kind of eyeballed them and said, hey, everybody looks tired, so we should practice less, or somebody's telling you we're practicing too much. Now there's a very scientific way to do it. Uh, but it also is a very helpful coaching tool for us, just like this week. Monday when the players were in the weight room, right. they had very good explosive movement and very good explosive power. So Tuesday when we go out and practice, uh, every group on the team was negative except the defensive line. They're the only ones. So I could say after practice, I said, hey, look, guys, you know, we're not practicing the way we need to practice because yesterday you had really good explosive power and speed and movement. And today, just because we're practicing, all right, just because of maybe who we're playing, I don't really know. All right, so maybe you don't feel real good today, but it goes back to that feeling versus choice thing. And um, you don't have the same kind of explosive movement. So are you, did you physically get tired from yesterday to today, which we really didn't do anything to make you tired? All right, so what is the reason all right, that we're not practicing the way we need to practice? So we, we, we can really catch them, you know, in a lot of ways now that we, <laughs> yeah. we really couldn't catch them before. The old big brother <laughs> is watching. Hey, Coach, we have a few future Crimson Tider right here to your right, and he has a question for you. Yes, sir. Um, Coach Nick, uh, after your narrow win against LSU, what has been your key message to your players this week? Uh, the team message to the players uh, this week was really all about, uh, you've heard me talk about this before, is did we play up to our capabilities? Uh, did we, what, what was the, the capability gap relative to how we competed, how we played in the game, and what we're capable of? Now, just the different parts of the team have really a different answer for that. You know, the defense played pretty well, especially, you know, at the end of the game to get the stops. But the offense was very inconsistent in moving the ball. We didn't do a very good job of, you know, running the ball in the game at all. So there were a lot of things to improve on. But one of the messages to the team was, you know, one of the earmarks of this program has always been winning on the line of scrimmage and playing with toughness up front. I, and that's something that we got to get back. And that usually starts with the offensive and defensive line. Uh, and that's something that, you know, our players have to challenge themselves to do. And I think they tried to do it this week. So hopefully that'll carry us through the end of the season. Thanks for being here tonight. Great question. Thank you. Tom, why don't you jump on in again? A moment ago, you, you asked the room. You talked about the value of preparation, and you asked the room, does anyone stand up if they had ever sort of not felt nervous about an important test, et cetera. When are you most nervous in a game week? Most nervous in a game week. I, I think the hardest time for me when it comes to um, is actually 
right before the game. Not before we go out. As soon as we go out for a pregame warm-up and everybody starts running around, I'm fine. Uh, when I get on the sidelines, I get the headset on, I'm fine. But when I'm sitting in the locker room for an hour, you know, getting dressed, I usually write some notes on what I'm going to say to the team. I usually I have this little card that I do that's pregame checklist that you go over with the coaches when you come off the field. I have this little, you know, when do you go for two chart and all this. I, so I kind of look at that stuff, but I'm really kind of shaking my leg the whole time. And that's when I'm most nervous. But once we go out, once we start pregame, once we get into it, then it's, it, it, I'm not nervous at all. I'm going to suggest, are you most nervous then? Because there is nothing more you can do to prepare. I think you hit the nail on the head. <laughs> that's it. That's it. Let's go to the phones, gentlemen. Wesley is down in Mobile with a question. Hi, Wesley. Good evening. Hi, Eli. How are you all? We're great. Thank you, sir. Glad you called. What's up? Uh, Coach, I, I was wondering if you could explain y'all's rationale uh, with our last possession in the game. Uh, I, I, my math may be off, but I, I thought we were pretty close to, getting, to being able to completely run out the clock if we got a first down. And it seemed with those timeout usage that we were sort of uh, not, not going for the kill, I guess, in the game to, to, to get off the field instead. What was, what was your thought process about, uh, about that? You're talking about at the end of the game? Yes, sir. Are you talking about the end of the game? Yeah, yeah, we needed to make a first down because they had timeouts. They used all their timeouts. We knew they could get the ball back with about a minute to go and probably 70 yards to go with no timeout. All right, so I didn't think they were going to score a touchdown in that situation. So if we would have passed the ball on third down to make a first down, and it would have been incomplete, then there would have been a minute 40 seconds to go in the game, and they would have had a much better chance to score a touchdown in the game. So you always have to make a choice. All right, are you going to try to win the game on offense? And to me, that depends on the circumstance and the situation. They have no timeouts. They're going to get the ball back with a minute to go in the game all right, with no timeouts. You tackle them one time inbounds, all right, and the clock's going to go down to 30. Uh, and they've got to throw the ball down the field. And um, so that was the reasoning for what we did. Now, let's just say there's two minutes to go in the game uh, or more time to go in the game. I think you have to do everything you need to do to get a first down. Uh, but I didn't like the play that we ran. Uh, even though it was third and eight, if we'd have just ran a direct run, maybe you got a chance to pop it or you don't. But we were going to get the 40 seconds off the clock and get it from 210 to 110 uh, or 120 uh, so that they would get the ball back with about a minute to go in a game with no timeouts. And we thought it was, was 70 yards to go that it was in our favor. So it was just the way we chose to try to win the game. And it really worked. So that was the thinking. So if we would have thrown a pass and it would have been incomplete and they got the ball back and scored a touchdown, everybody would be saying now, why did you throw the ball on third down? So it's, I get it. It is what it is. But at least it worked this time. And that's the bottom line right there, exactly. Do, why don't people, I shouldn't have framed the question this way. I'll ask it in a more open-ended way. How hard is it to win? It is really hard to win. Why don't people appreciate or respect that enough? Because when you win all the time, people lose respect for winning. Yep. They just expect it, um, and they don't really... And, you know, it happens to players. It, you know, I think it's happened to our players at times. You know, we won 19 games in a row. We went to Texas a and I was like... I thought we had a horrible week. I didn't, you know, the media was saying A&M lost two games in a row. They're not very good. I don't think we had the proper respect. I don't think we knew what we were getting into. I thought A&M probably had one of the best teams in the league. They just lost their quarterback early on. They were playing a young guy. He had struggled for a couple games, but if he ever played better, which I knew he was capable of, you know, they would be back to being a really good team, and it would be a real tough game for us. But you lose respect for winning – but really what you lose is respect for what you have to do to win. 
And uh, that's a major problem uh, because you develop bad habits. You don't develop good habits in practice. You don't do things the right way. You're not telling, taking care of yourself the way you need to. You're not sleeping. You're not eating. You're not doing what you're supposed to do. And then all of a sudden when you get to the game, everybody wants to win when you get to the game. All right? But if you didn't do the right things to prepare yourself, then you really can't play the way you'd like to play when you get challenged by another good player. And then you get frustrated, which affects your performance even more when things don't go well. And your expectation is, is that everything is going to go well. We're just going to show up and win. And you get punched in the nose and it's not working that way. It's really the wrong mindset. Uh, and it's not going to help you be successful at all. We're coming right back. Don't go away. We've got lots more with the coach and with Tom Rinaldi from Fox Sports. We're live here in Tuscaloosa on the Crimson Tide Sports Network from Learfield. Johnson waits, claps his hands, looks at his running back, gets the snap, stands in, down he goes! Will Anderson, come on down! Will Anderson continuing to uh, excel at uh, Alabama and of course getting more and more national honors each and every day. He's getting uh, this award and that award and we're thrilled for the job that Will Anderson has been doing. Welcome back. The Nick Saban Show continues. This segment being brought to you by New Coke Zero Sugar. New look, improved taste. New Coke Zero Sugar. Coach, we've got another question from uh, the Nick Saban Show blog on AL.com. Ben in Charlotte, North Carolina, says, we continue to recruit at such a high level. I am curious how much time each day, on average, that you spend on recruiting. Keep up the great work and roll tide. Well, I think it varies. Uh, I think you have to recruit every day to be a good recruiter. Uh, for me, uh, during the season, uh, last night is recruiting night for me. So I try to contact at least eight to 10 players each and every week in recruiting. So I'll talk to four or five guys on Wednesday. I talked to, I think, three guys before I came on the radio show. I'll talk to a couple more tonight. On Fridays when we have home games, we spend uh, the first hour or hour and a half of the day uh, during recruiting evaluations. And then we will have at least one recruiting meeting uh, on Thursday. Uh, each and every week, like who's going to go see who play uh, on Friday night, how many coaches are going out, how many are staying here. But, of course, in the off season, we are spending way more time than that, you know, on recruiting. Just like this last week, you know, we had seven official visits uh, for the LSU game. So I spent the whole day before the game, every day that I, every minute on Saturday that I wasn't with our team, which was started at like 10.45. We took a walk, right? and uh, we had a staff meeting before that, and we had a recruiting meeting in that. But then from like 11.30 till church at 1.30 and pregame at 2, I, I was talking to recruits. Right? And then from 2.15 until 3.35 when we had walkthrough, I was talking to recruits. All right? So I spent the whole day talking to recruits. We had, I spent the whole pregame when I was sitting there by nervous time, talking to recruits <laughs> all right, when we get to the stadium. Um, and then we had probably 500 people after the game that I talked to about recruiting, some very good players and some very good recruits. Then Sunday, we had all seven to the house all right, and their families, probably 80 people on Sunday morning. I go 845 church. I get home at 10. The house is full of people. Uh, we do the whole thing. Uh, Maybe about 11.30, I start taking them back, and then I talk to seven people and their families, seven families, the players and their families. And normally, I would start on the next team about 12.30. We didn't start on the next team until about 2.30. Uh, so it varies. Now, we don't have any official visits this weekend, even though we'll have a lot of recruits come to the game. Uh, next week when we play Arkansas, we'll have official visits. I think we have five. So it's a lot of time spent by a lot of people uh, because the number one thing you need to do in recruiting is you, you got to make sure you're giving people the adequate amount of attention so that they understand the kind of relationships they'll have here, you know, when they come here. Nick, I think that's for anyone who hears that, what you just laid out, 
who is less familiar with the beats of what the job entails, that's pretty mind-blowing. And for many coaches, that's the first sign that they're no longer as passionate. They wane in terms of that level of demand in recruiting, which opens up a door to ask this question. There are so many guys who ultimately get overwhelmed by the pressures or worn down by the pressures and responsibilities and expectations of being a head coach. Why hasn't that happened for you? <sighs> the man asks good questions. Ask good questions. Um, I, I think it's probably because um, I, I, I do have to say that there are times during the season where I, I do get tired uh, and I do get worn down. Uh, to some degree. But I think the key to the drill for me is if I can stay on a routine that's very manageable for me. In other words, I could tell you what I'm going to do every minute of the week from Sunday when I go to church I, until the game's over on Saturday night. I, I can, and as long as I can do that, I'm good. I, but when things happen I, that take me out of that, and the biggest thing for me to overcome now is when we play a night game on the road and we get home at 2 o'clock in the morning and I still get up at 6 o'clock in the morning and I do everything that I do on Sunday and it takes me about three days to recover. Mm -hmm. You know, in the old days, you know, I could do that and the next day I'd be fine. Uh, and when I worked for Belichick, we did that every day. All right, we did it every day. I mean, we got home at 2 o'clock every day. I, and we got up at 6 o'clock the next day every day. I'm talking about for the whole season. So, um, but I could do it then. I, I don't know if I could do it now. <laughs> so, but if I can stay on my little routine, you know, I, I'm good. I, I don't get wore down and I'm good. But, um, boy, sometimes, you know, those late games get me. Coach, a visitor right here to your right with a question for you. Good evening, sir. How you doing, Coach? I'm doing great. How are you? Good, good. What are some of the biggest challenges you're going to face this week or you have faced this week facing New Mexico State? Well, you know, these are the kind of teams that when you play these teams, um, just like I said last week on this show, all right, LSU is a dangerous team all right, because they're going to do everything and throw the kitchen sink at you, but you don't know which one's coming and what they're going to do because they have nothing to lose. Like the first time, they fake punt. Mm -hmm. I mean, they actually called timeout to fake punt. You know, I like to kick myself because we should have changed punt safe up on them, and then it had really been messed up, and I didn't do that. Uh, we did it at halftime because we hadn't practiced it, but we should have done it. All right, so like all the blitzing that they did, uh, I mean, it's like they have nothing to lose and everything to gain. So you're going to get their best shot, and you're going to get a lot of things that you haven't prepared for. I think when you play in games like this, this team is a lot like Mississippi State. They'll probably throw the ball 65, 70 times in the game. Wow. Uh, and if they hit those balls and you're not really on your toes in the passing game, you know, a lot of things can go wrong in the passing game, but a lot of things can go right. You can make a lot of explosive plays too. And if you have a couple breakdowns, you know you're letting people in the game. And then their style of defense is lots of pressure, lots of plugging backers, uh, lots of things that we have not handled well, which this is really a good thing for us because it's made us practice against this type of stuff all week long. So uh, that's a good thing. Uh, so when you're playing these kind of teams, they have nothing to lose and everything to gain. So to see a throwback pass to the quarterback or whatever, you know, reverse, throw it back to the quarterback, throw it down. So those are the kind of things that are difficult to prepare for, and your players got to be able to play on principle. But then the other challenge is, is play five SEC games in a row. They're all big games. All right, now you're playing a game that's not an SEC game. Everybody wants to get relief syndrome. You know what relief syndrome is? All right, we got an easy game this week. I don't have to worry about this. I don't have to prepare like I need to. I don't have to practice like I always do. And then you go out and play, not so good. Now, I've been in these games now. You know, when I was at LSU, we lost to UAB. All right, and when I came here the first year, we lost to ULM. Go pump some gas after you do that and see what the guy at the window tells you. <laughs> <laughs> 
I've been there. What does he tell you? I have, I have my national. I just want to wear a national championship ring anymore. I stopped him to get gas and pay the guy, and he said, what's that? I said, it's my national championship game. We we're going to do the same thing here. After we lost it to ULM, he said, we'll never do it while that Nick Saban's a coach. He's still pumping gas, and you're wearing <laughs> tons of rings, though. You don't let that go by. Hey, let's go to Atlanta for our next phone call. D Demetrius is with us on the telephone. Hey, Demetrius, how are you? Hey, I'm fine. I'm it's the first time ever getting to talk to Coach. That's pretty amazing to me. All right, Demetrius, you're on, baby. Uh, I just wanted to know about how you feel about Bill O'Brien being in the press box versus being down on the field like past offensive coordinators. Being down on the field or in the press box? Yeah. Um, yes, sir. You know, I, I, I think that we've had success with guys being in both places. Uh, and I think that um, it really is up to the individual. And I've talked about this before. You know, it's much easier to call the game in the press box. When I was a college coordinator uh, at Michigan State, I called the game from the press box because you can lay all your calls out in front of you and you can see what you want to do, and it actually helps you. And in between series, you can look at what you called, what you didn't call, what you want to call next. When you're on the sidelines, uh, you got to be like a guy that's taking the numbers without paper and pencil, man. You got to know everything in your head. You got to know every call, every signal, all right? And 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 it's got to come right now. When they say they got four wideouts in a game, what are you going to call? Well, it scared me to death when I went to the Cleveland Browns with Belichick, and he said, "You have to be on the field. You have to be on the field. You cannot be in the press box as a coordinator." Why? Because I want you on the sidelines because you're going to do all the presentations to the defensive players. You'll be the ones that can make, you know, the adjustments with them and so forth. So I, I just don't like coordinators being in a press box. That was his philosophy. So I went on the sidelines, and I learned, man, I learned the hard way how you have to really, how hard it is to call the game and signal the plays. I, and then have the head coach screaming in your ear not to do that while you're trying to make that decision. All right, so that was really hard. Um, so I'll tell you this story. I had, a, I, I had a thing with Pepper Johnson, who was the Mike linebacker, when I was at the Browns, and I would signal the defense, and Bill would be saying, no, 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 don't do that. <laughs> so uh, we actually lost a game because I changed the call once. Um, and... Uh, it, to, to what he wanted? To what he wanted. So I told Pepper after that, I said, look, Pepper, I said, I'm going to give you a signal, and you touch your face mask when you got the signal. I, and if Bill wants to change after that, we're done. We're done. I'm going to say, he, he looked away, I can't give him another signal. And that's how we operated the rest of the time. <laughs> if, 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 if Bill knew that, he'd probably kill me. <laughs> but anyway, back to your question. All right, so... It's actually easier and more effective to be a play caller in the press box unless you feel totally comfortable being on the field. You know, Bill has done it both ways. We thought with our staff and the situation on our staff, and he felt more comfortable being in the press box. All right, so, um, and I, I, th I actually think, you know, he's done a pretty good job. I think we all had a bad game last week. Uh, he'd be the first to say that, and me too. Uh, because we're responsible for what happens on the field, and it wasn't good, uh, especially on that side of the ball. So, um, but I don't think that's a reason to question what we've done all year. I mean, we were the number one scoring team in the SEC, I think, and, um, you know, last week was not good. We're coming right back. Great stories on this show, huh? That's what I, one of the many things I love about these Thursday night get-togethers. We're returning more of the Nick Saban Show. It's presented by Alpha Insurance. For auto, home, and life insurance, call Alpha. This is the Crimson Tide Sports Network from Learfield. Again, Bryce backpedals, has time, loads up, looks long. Jamison Williams got it behind the defense. He is gone. Touchdown. It was a beauty of a combination as Alabama, of course, goes on to defeat the LSU Tigers by a final of 20 to 14. From Fox Sports, Tom Rinaldi is with us this evening. Tom, jump in with another question uh, for the coach. He is 
busily uh, signing some pictures up here on the stage. What else is on your mind, Tom? Nick, uh, just a, uh, a simple and quick question. I've had the opportunity to get a chance to have these conversations with you now for more than a decade and a half, and I brought this up with you today. How would you describe your sense of humor? <laughs> where, where do you come up with these questions? <laughs> I would say most people would say I have a terrible sense of humor. <laughs> That's what I would assume. You really don't. Be, be, but people that know me and know me well um, know that that's probably not true. And I think the players would tell you the same thing, that that's not true. But from a public perception standpoint, I would say most people think I'm very serious, uh, don't have any fun, don't smile very much. And that's not really true. It's just not what they see. You guys have been up here giggling the whole during the commercial break. It was like a couple of hyenas going at it up here. So uh, uh, that's right. Uh, that really is. A man has a great sense of humor. Coach, uh, the clock on the wall says it is time for your final word of the week presented by Mercedes-Benz. Mercedes-Benz, the best or nothing. Well, I think it's really important for our team uh, to continue to establish an identity uh, as a team. I, I don't really think we're, what, nine games into the season, and I don't think we've done that because we don't seem to have an ability to, you know, success is defined by consistency and performance. And even though we win games, our performance has not always been consistent as we'd like for it to, you know. We'd like to say we'd like to dominate the competition. Uh, and, you know, that's not something we've done on a consistent basis. Uh, so that's still an identity of toughness and discipline uh, that you need, I think, to have a championship team. Um, you know, we've had championship teams before. We know what they're like. We know what kind of identity you have to have internally on those teams when it comes to these intangible things. And uh, that's something that we still have to prove that we can do on a consistent basis. We've done all those things at times. We just have not done them on a consistent basis. So uh, this game is an opportunity. We respect our opponent, but this is an opportunity for us to try to establish that kind of an identity for 60 minutes of the game. I think we only played one game this year. That was at Mississippi State after we got beat by Texas A&M where we played a really good 60-minute game. Both sides of the ball, I, every, every, you know, 100%. And uh, that's something that we have to establish because as we play better teams down the road, and, and I'm talking about the rest of the season, uh, we've got tough games to play against good teams. And if we don't, we don't do that on a consistent basis, and those are the things that, you know, you have to create for yourself. And I think that's only going to happen, and we talked about this last week, that's only going to happen when people are accountable to do what they're supposed to do and they challenge each other to be accountable internally. Mm -hmm. You know, you didn't hear this, but last week, you know, I gave this speech about what's everybody's number one fear. It's speaking in front of a thousand people. Mm -hmm. That's everybody's number one fear. So... We also carry that same fear into telling our friend something that he needs to do that would help him be more successful or be better, but we don't want to hurt his feelings or we don't want to make him mad, all right? So we're afraid we're going to do that, so we don't do it. And does that really help our friend? Does that really help our teammate uh, who is we would be much better off to confront and demand that they do the right thing, not in a positive way, uh, and that's where leadership, you know, really creates a lot of accountability uh, internally on your team. And I think that's got to happen on this team. It's got to continue to grow and develop. And I think if it does, you know, we can finish the way we want to. But it's going to start with this game this weekend. And we love playing in Bryant-Denny Stadium. I know it's an early game, but I hope everybody comes out and is enthusiastic and supports the team like we need to. Definitely. Yeah. Coach, thanks as always, sir, for your time. Great to have you with us. That's Coach Nick Saban. Tom Rinaldi, in the moment we have remaining, uh, has there been anybody that you have just been in awe of after you finished interviewing them? Uh, I know for me, sitting down with the great coach Eddie Robinson, sitting down with John Wooden, I said, man, this, that was cool. Who was on that list for you? Uh, I, I think the list is way too long. 
to tell you the truth, because when you, when you tell stories and you share someone's story, I'm perpetually in awe of two things, what people share and the strength they have to bear it. And if we can tap into that, I think w somehow we don't really respect that enough in one another often enough because people are amazingly strong and they are amazingly compassionate yes, they are. when they are recognized and appreciated and connected. And sharing a story, as simple as it is, sometimes can connect us. It leads to understanding before judgment. That's what a story can do.